Well, the first thing I want to say is you did it again, Dan. Tiffany, you did it again. Another amazing series of master classes. I love them. Um, I learned something, even though I'm a marketer, I learned something every single time. And that's exciting to me because you keep growing and learning, right? So another great season five or series five of classes. So I thank you and Tiffany for the hard work that went into it. And thank you for making them such high quality. The second thing is I want to say hello to everyone. Uh, it's great to be with you. Welcome to another installment of Mayor Daniela Levin Cava's Strive 305 Digital Master uh, Masterclass Marketing Masterclass Series with the amazing team at BizHack, Dan and Tiffany. And I'm really excited about today's class because this is part of the Mayor Strive 305 initiative to help you strengthen your marketing. And you know, if there's one thing I've learned in 20 years as an entrepreneur, it's this: that entrepreneurship is entrepreneurship is a team sport and that you shouldn't try to do it alone. You need a team around you, especially in marketing. That's why I'm eager to see what uh, Dan has to teach us today about this topic, about who's in your marketing seat. Dan, I'm really looking forward to it, and I know it's going to be another great class. So everybody, enjoy, and welcome to this installment of the Digital Marketing Masterclass Series. And uh, you know we're probably not going to get a chance to talk about this again today, but did you want to just do a little bit of a tease for what's coming up in September in Season 6? Yes, yeah, so in season six, one of the things that we are, are working on for, for our next uh, season is the whole idea of Web3 and how marketers and small business owners can really leverage that new technology that's happening. I know that we hear a lot of things, right, about uh, things like crypto and the, the underlying blockchain technologies that underlie it. But it's time to think about how can you put these technologies, what are they, how can you put them to use in your business and how can you take your business forward using what's coming? Web3, including uh, possibly metaverse and all these things that we're hearing about. What does it all mean for you as a small business owner? We want to help to kind of decode that for you in a series of classes along those lines. So was that good enough, Dan? Well, yeah. I, you know, oh, it's fantastic. I mean, it's, it's a tough one, right? Because there's so much, um, you know, hype. Uh, around this area. And so what we, we kind of want to do with this is we want to cut through the hype and just talk to you about like what you need to know to get ready. That's uh, right. there, there are things that you can be doing now to get your business ready. Um, and, uh, and so that's really our goal is to, you know, you, you guys have come to trust us and rely on us to be kind of, um, you know, t truth tellers, if you will, and, and not get caught up in the hype uh, around digital marketing or or Web3. And so that's that's really the goal for us there. And um, obviously, uh, we're also going to be including kind of a DE&I perspective, uh, as we do on everything we do, uh, diversity, equity and inclusion, which is, you know, you know, how does this, um, you know, uh, relate specifically to the minority and uh, and women-owned businesses that uh, represent a, a majority of the businesses here in South Florida. That's right. So, um, you know, with that, uh, I'm really excited to get started. Um, and uh, here we go. Uh, just a quick uh, point, guys. Um, you, uh, I would like for you guys, if you, if you do have a chance to start asking questions, uh, in the Q and A box below, and Tiffany, could you just walk folks through sort of how to ask a question uh, so that we can address them at the end? Uh, we're going to do an AMA, and I'll stick around uh, until we get all your questions answered. Absolutely. So on the bottom, there's like a chat button, and there's a Q and A button. So the chat button is when you just want to make a comment, be like, "Oh wow, great information." And then the Q and A button is when you actually put in like, "I didn't quite understand this and this. Can you elaborate?" Or "How do I know if I'm doing marketing correctly?" Questions along those lines. Put them in the Q and A section, and not the chat because we don't look at the chat for questions. Only the Q and A. And the more questions you put in the Q&A, the more you'll learn, the more you'll get out of this. So definitely fill that up with questions. Beautiful, perfect. All right. So um, I'm gonna share my screen now. I'm gonna make sure that you guys can see it. And here we go. So having a little bit of technical difficulties, as I've mentioned to you guys in previous sessions, I'm actually joining you 
from Spain. Sorry for the slight delay in the start, but I'll make sure to get you out on time. Um, so, uh, Tiff, can you hear me okay? Yep, look good, sound good. All right, and I, I'm assuming it's still loading on your side, but now you're seeing my screen? Correct. All right, beautiful. All right, so we're all set, here we go. So um, let's see, we have zero questions in the Q&A. Uh, I really, like we had 40 in the first one, 31 in the second. Let's see if we can't beat that record or at least get to 100 total. So we need 30 questions in the Q&A and we just got our first. Uh, Miguel Ache, uh, so appreciate you. Thank you for doing that. Um, keep them coming, guys. What is your number one question in digital marketing? Now, this could be your most burning question, the thing that's holding you back. Uh, this could be uh, just something you've been curious about or want to learn a little bit more about. Um, this could be uh, a question you know the answer to, but you think others would benefit from. What's the number one question in digital marketing? It's actually the question we've been asking throughout these master classes, and uh, I'm going to answer it today for you uh, and talk about what my number one question in digital marketing is. Um, we talked about the amazing Strive 305 partnership. I cannot thank you enough, Danilo, for funding these and making these possible. Um, <clears throat> South Florida PBS and the Health Channel are our media sponsor. And we have this incredible collection of chambers of commerce and other organizations uh, that are helping us uh, get well more than 100 people per session uh, to each of these master classes. And we couldn't do it without you. So these three master classes were a little different. This season five was a little different than what we've done in the past. Um, these are actually the first master classes that I have led, uh, the CEO and founder of BizHack. Uh, Dan Gretsch, and, that, and they're also kind of designed as a little mini course. And so for those of you who haven't attended sessions one and two, I'm going to walk you through what the mini course covered. And today is the big culmination uh, of that mini course. Super excited to share with you um, really how it all kind of comes together uh, into the number one question in all of marketing. Uh, so the first was about business storytelling. Um, and the, so the overall goals of the course is purpose-driven digital marketing through storytelling. And the learning objectives for the overall course is to develop your business story, your origin story, and your core purpose to set a solid foundation for your marketing. That was session one. To learn a systematic approach to marketing your business, which we call the lead building system. That was session two. No more random acts of marketing allowed. And then number three is first who, then what? Right, getting the right person in the marketing seat as the critical first step to marketing success. So back in class one, just to remind those of you who were there and to share this with those of you who weren't, and uh, Tiffany, when we send the follow-up email to these folks, if possible, could we include links to the YouTube videos of what, what sessions one and two? Yep. Perfect. So you guys will have access to those if you happen to miss them and you wanted to kind of review class one and two. If this one excites you and turns you on, there's two more hours of it. The first one we talked about purpose-driven business storytelling, probably my, 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 my unique specialty uh, as a former journalist uh, and storyteller. We talked about the story of me and the origin story of the business. We talked about the core purpose of the business, your why. And then we talked about where to put this business story uh, to attract your ideal customer. Then in class two, it was all about the process of building campaigns and marketing. We introduced you guys to the lead building system, which is a proven process for purpose-driven digital marketing that we've developed here at BizHack over seven years, working with 700 companies. We then had you assess your marketing strengths and weaknesses to get your lead building system score and then workshop that so that you could actually start making, addressing some of the weaknesses uh, in your marketing that might be holding you back. And that brings us to today, the number one question of all marketing, who's in your marketing seat? This is a people first approach to growth uh, and how to find the right person to head your marketing efforts. I'm gonna make a case for why who's in your marketing seat is the number one question in all, all of marketing. We're gonna talk about some different operating systems you can use to organize your digital marketing efforts. And then we're going to talk about how to build your marketing team through staff, agency, and contractors. And this notion of what we call one size fits one, that uh, it's a little bit of choose your own adventure. All three paths can work. 
Uh, it's really a matter of what you as the owner prefer. We have seven questions in the Q&A. Uh, keep them coming, guys. I want to at least have 30. So your thank you gifts, uh, we're going to have a handout with key takeaways. Uh, we'll send you a link to our YouTube channel where a recording of today's webinar will be posted. You'll be registered automatically for the upcoming master classes uh, that we talked about in season six in September on Web3 and Metaverse. And you'll get some information about BizHack scholarship program for minority and women owned businesses. As I said, I'm Dan Gretsch, founder and CEO of, uh, of BizHack and the Masterclass Instructor. 20 years of experience as a storyteller in journalism. Now the last 10 years of experience as a business storyteller, helping companies tell their purpose-driven uh, business story and to help use that to attract their ideal customer. Uh, we've been uh, recognized with a lot of awards uh, and we've partnered with some of the top uh, educational and small business support organizations in South Florida, including the three major universities, the Office of the Mayor, the SBDC, Miami Bayside Foundation, Hispanic Unity, FSMSDC, and many, many more. Our core purpose is to provide you, the small business owner, with a simpler way to grow so you and your business can thrive. We love turning lives around, and we believe that our training and our consulting can do that for you. We have five core values that you'll see evidenced in the way we train and teach. One is to learn by doing, that get off your duff and do the work. You'll see results and you'll learn in the process. To grow with purpose. We are not interested in working with companies that are just in it to make a buck. We really want companies that are looking to change the world for the better. Um, create community. One of the ways that we create community is by uh, inviting amazing folks onto these webinars live together. We're all watching this together. I remember back in the day, I used to be at NPR and the community of listeners, you guys are the community of viewers and, and we really are big in, in, in that. And we have a community of our consultants, the uh, chief marketing officers that we place in different companies. We have the community of business owners that we serve. We have the community of vendors and other allies that we have to help you uh, as a business grow. Be authentic. I talk a lot about like where I come from and what I value and how I was raised. And uh, that authenticity uh, is really what works um, in, in marketing and in sales and definitely social media. And it's a big part of of what we encourage you to do and who we are as a company. And then blameless problem solving. Um, it's really easy as a business owner to beat yourself up for you know, past marketing failures or efforts to grow that haven't gone to anything. And we basically say today is a new day, let's look forward and how can we solve uh, the challenges that we face. Um, the way that we work with companies is we have a consulting service where we place a part-time head of marketing what we call a fractional CGO. Um, we'll talk about that uh, towards the end, but this is really for companies that are 500K and above that don't have a head of marketing and need one and the owner wants to get out of the marketing seat. For smaller companies, we train and upskill through courses and coaching. Uh, that's the owners of smaller companies or the key marketing staff of slightly larger companies. And then for uh, corporations and municipalities, we do run private courses in case you're interested in doing something like that in your community. So again, we have seven questions so far. You know, thank you, Julio and Chandra and, Mich uh, and Miguel and Leonette and Aurelio and Kathleen. Would love a couple more questions. What's your number one question in all digital marketing? I'll answer all those at the end. And now to my number one question in digital marketing, who's in your digital marketing seat? So when I started digital marketing uh, training 10 years ago, the number one question in all of marketing was how do I generate profitable leads? That's what every business owner wanted to know. That's what I as a business owner wanted to know. And it is, has been really what has guided most of the history of BizHack is coming up with better and better and simpler and simpler and more sophisticated answers to the question, how do I generate profitable leads? And it was about a year ago when I started really talking to my business owner clients and asking them what their challenges were that I realized, nope, that is not the number one question in all of marketing. 
the number one question in all of marketing is who's your head of marketing? And if it's you as the visionary CEO, you're not the right person for the job. The idea here is all of us focus when it comes to marketing on the what. Which channels do we use? TikTok, Google Ads, Facebook, um, you know, which agency do I pick? All of you guys are focused on the what of marketing. And that's what how do I generate profitable leads is all about, the what of marketing. First, you got to start with who, then what. This is the big realization that I got by reading the Jim Collins book, uh, Good to Great. He talked about the idea that the companies that are the most successful in the history of business have all had this very simple pre precept at the center of their success. Get the right people on the bus and in the right seat. Here's what he wrote about in Good to Great. When facing chaos and uncertainty, and gosh knows that all of us have faced chaos and uncertainty as small businesses with COVID and all the other things that are happening. Chaos and uncertainty is the only certainty uh, in business. And when facing chaos and uncertainty, and you cannot possibly predict what's coming around the corner, your best strategy is to have a busload of people who can adapt and perform brilliantly no matter what comes next. Great vision without great people is irrelevant. First who, then what? Jim Collins studied the best performing companies in the history of business. And this was one of the primary lessons that he learned. There is a fabulous book, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this, that is basically an operating system for how to operate a small business. It's called Traction by Gino Wickman. And Gino took this idea and he's kind of create, he, he's the master of simplifying and clarifying. And he called it RPRS, right person, right seat. And at the heart of traction is you set your marketing goals and then you want to hold people uh, individually accountable um, for the roles that they play in the company. Um, and so what that means is every goal that you set as a company is an individual assigned to it. And a good fit for a role the person has to meet two tests. Number one, they have to share the company's core values. If they're, if they're misaligned with your values, you got to let them go, no matter how good a performer they are. And that kind of core values discussion is for another day. The, the second one is what he calls GWC. Gets it, wants it, and has the capacity to do it. Does the person get the role? Do they understand what the job is? Does the person want the role? And does the person have the capacity to do it, GWC? So there's a really simple tool that they've built to kind of illustrate or map uh, how this works in an organization and they call it the accountability chart. And we're going to talk about the accountability chart for a business and then a little bit later in the presentation, we're going to talk about the accountability chart for a small business marketing department. So again, this is from Traction. Um, what Gina Wickman would say is that there's a visionary who's at the head of the company. Uh, she has a integrator who really kind of keeps the trains running on time. And then there are essentially just like three departments in every business, no matter what type you are. There's a sales and marketing department, an operations department and a finance department. Um, the visionary CEO is really the person who usually founded the company. They often have ADHD. They get distracted by bright, shiny objects and new opportunities. The integrator is the metronome, the person that keeps the operations running, that COO or that head of operations that just keeps everybody on track and on task. And then basically sales and marketing is about bringing in new customers and upselling existing ones. Operations is about serving them, and finance is about making sure that you're getting that you're profitable while doing that. Right. So it's a very simple, but I think really clarifying way to think about how to organize a company. 
And one thing to keep in mind is that when you start out and you're like a little micro business, you know, maybe earning under $100,000, you are playing every single one of these roles. You're in all five of these seats, right? When you start, you're the visionary CEO and the chief bottle washer. But as you grow, you need to start getting out of seats. You got to remove yourself. What, what uh, Gina Wickman calls, you got to let go of the vine. And when you're removing yourself from seats, one of the first questions you might ask is, which seats do I get out of? And today I'm going to make a case for why you need to get out of the head of marketing seat. Now, most business owners are in the head of sales seat. And actually that I think makes a lot more sense to me. But the head of marketing seat is generally not a good fit. So let's talk about what the head of marketing does and why most CEOs are not a good fit for it. So the head of marketing sets the growth strategy. They establish clear success metrics. They make sure that everyone's rowing in the same direction. And they make sure that they have the right doers in place to actually get the work done, right? That's the head of marketing role. The issue is that visionary CEOs are generally a terrible fit for the head of marketing role. Why? Because the roles are fundamentally in conflict. The visionary CEO, your job is to look beyond the horizon. What's coming in the next six to 12 months and to prepare the company today to be ready for that opportunity. The head of marketing is deeply engaged in the here and the now. Where are the customers? What do they need today? And how do we get them uh, to convert today? The visionary CEO has to be obsessed with the job of building the company of the future. How do you keep this company uh, alive for the long term. The head of marketing is how do I grow the company of today? The visionary CEO defines the core purpose and values of, of her company. The head of marketing builds purpose-driven growth strategy to accomplish that vision, to accomplish that purpose. The visionary CEO is all about big relationships. These could be big sales, it could be partnerships, these could be hiring people, you know, executive leadership, recruiting, um, managing the board, if you have a board or advisors, big relationships. Head of marketing helps nurture those relationships, make sure that they stay strong for the long term. The visionary CEO does always have a role in marketing and that's as a thought leader or influencer in your industry, right? Nobody better than the, the CEO, the person who founded the company to be that thought leader, that influencer. The head of marketing helps make sure that that CEO gets noisy and in front of as many people as possible. And finally, the visionary CEO has primarily a leadership recruiting and kind of long-term strategy role. The head of marketing is gonna get into the weeds. It's a much more tactical role. How do you optimize campaigns and get the best results? And then there's obviously growth strategy attached to that. So I really do believe that a visionary CEO, the founder of a company, very rarely is able to sit in the head of marketing seat successfully. I've seen this countless times. They are a bad fit. And here's what's worse. Companies that are at about that 500K and above mark with CEOs sitting in the head of marketing, it's distracting them from growing the company faster. It slows down growth because they're not spending as much time on big relationships because they're spending all their time nurturing existing relationships and working on smaller relationships. And frankly, I have almost never met a CEO who's happy being in the marketing role. And, and, and let me be very, blunt and honest about this. I am a deeply expert in marketing and I do not sit in the head of marketing seat in my own company. So I, I drink my own Kool-Aid. Uh, we hired a part-time uh, chief growth officer and it's really turned around uh, the, the company uh, since we did that. So let's talk about this challenge of filling the head of marketing role. It's a tough one, especially if you're a small business. First of all, you're really limited in time, money, and in-house expertise. Almost no small business that's under $5 million in revenue can afford a full-time CMO or chief marketing officer. Often, it's actually really hard to recruit someone, even if you had the money for it, because 
not a ton of CMO types actually want to work for little businesses. That's not really their goal. They prefer working with bigger businesses, bigger budgets, uh, bigger impact, uh, bigger reach that it's just more fun. It's more fun to have a multi-million dollar marketing budget than to be scraping pennies together to get, uh, get clients. So even if you did have a budget for a CMO, good luck finding them in this job market. Now, for a lot of you got you businesses are looking to take it to the next level, you don't actually have anyone on your team who's a fit for the role. So you kind of sit in that seat as the owner by default. Um, and there's really no one who's a good fit to kind of rise into that role. And just by definition, a marketing agency can't fill that seat. Uh, and and I, I don't go in, into a lot of depth as to why that is, but I really don't believe that when you're hiring an agency um, that's usually there to kind of get a job done, run ads for you, do SEO for you, run social media for you, that they can't really have that overall strategic role that you really need them to, to fill that head of marketing seat. So most businesses that are past that 500K threshold, haven't yet reached the $10 million mark, find themselves in this really tough position where they can't afford a full-time CMO, they have no one in-house to fill the role, the owner's not a fit for the role, and they can't hire a marketing agency to do it. So, so what do you do? And this is the solution that's emerged um, in the last few years. It's a relatively new phenomenon, and it's called the part-time head of marketing or fractional CMO. What does a fractional CMO do? They develop and lead your growth strategy. They organize and, leads the, and lead those growth efforts. They upskill you and your team uh, with a systematic process for digital lead generation. No more random acts of marketing. They make your agencies and contractors accountable for results with clear KPIs and consistent oversight. They identify low-hanging fruit and fill gaps to bring on the right agency partners and contractors to get the work done. And ultimately, they allow the CEO to embrace her role as a thought leader and influencer, which is critical for attracting your, key, your ideal client. Part of the reason we want to get the CEO out of the head of marketing role is so they can spend more time being a thought leader or influencer and not dealing with the minutia and the day-to-day -day of marketing. So we've answered the number one question of marketing, which is who's your head of marketing? It shouldn't be the owner. It should be a part-time or fractional CMO. So what's the number two question in all of marketing? Encourage you guys, we have 16 questions in the Q&A. Go ahead and throw your number two question in all of marketing. Uh, and then I'll share what mine is. The number two question in all of marketing is, okay, you've got this like part-time CMO, but who does the actual execution, right? Who's doing the work? Who are the doers? So to answer that question, I wanted to make a couple of distinctions. In marketing, there are two types of marketing, marketers. There's the left brain and the right brain. The left brain and the right brain, the creative and the technical, the folks that are really good at talking to humans and the folks that are really good at talking to robots. There was a time when you really only needed the creative type to be your marketer where you really just needed someone really skilled at the human to human piece. But in essence, what digital marketing has done, it has required a whole new different type of marketer, which is that technical marketer, that uh, marketer who's better at talking to the robots and the algorithms. And that has been, in essence, a big part of the revolution of digital marketing is how technical a field it has become, one that requires a much heavier emphasis on technology and technology tools and tracking and, and analytics. So what I tried to do here is map out, you remember how you had the visionary, the integrator, and then marketing and sales? Inside of marketing and sales, I wanted to kind of map out a basic accountability chart for a marketing department. So you have the head of marketing, right? The CMO or the chief growth officer of CGO, they develop 
uh, the growth strategy. Then you have a project manager, right? So they're, they're given the strategy. Now they need to so, someone who's going to do the day-to-day -day work of it. This is generally what the director of marketing does. They execute the growth strategy. And the execution of the growth strategy is done by doers. The doers are usually creative team. They do the branding, the video, the content, social media, community management, and then what's known as the MarTech team or the marketing technology team. They run the customer relationship management software or CRM, the tracking, the analytics, the automation, the optimization. That is the most basic marketing department. Now, just like everything we've been talking about, if you're kind of small, you got to fill all those roles, right? Um, or if you have a small team, you have people filling multiple roles. For instance, your head of marketing might also be the project manager for tasks. Um, but this is really what the roles are if you really wanted to build them out. Somebody who's sort of setting the strategy, another person who's kind of keeping the day-to-day -day of executing it, and then a creative team and a MarTech team. And notice that there's a little bit of a parallel here to the visionary and integrator, right? The head of marketing is a little bit like the visionary and the marketing project manager is a little bit like the integrator. Now, a couple other points. Everyone on the team must be adept at data-driven decision-making. Data is not optional. Even if you're more creative, you must learn how to learn, analyze data, uh, make decisions based on data. That is not an optional thing. That's not somewhat, something to leave to someone on the MarTech team. You must be adept at that at every level in marketing. And then the other thing is that I am a strong believer that the head of marketing and the marketing project manager are best if done in-house. What does that mean? What that means is that um, this can be a part-time or full-time person, but you want that person to be inside of the organization, working with the CEO and the executive leadership, working with the marketing and the sales and operations folks. You really want them to be like deeply integrated into your company and helping facilitate communication across departments. What we find is that if you try to outsource the head of marketing or the project management of marketing, it rarely works out well. You end up getting sales and marketing fighting with each other. Marketing is dri driving leads that operations uh, can't handle. Um, you know, and things kind of the wheels sort of start falling off the bus, if you will. Not everyone doesn't isn't necessarily rowing in the same direction. When it comes to the doers, though, you have some choices. It's a little bit more of a mix and match, and it's we call it choose your own adventure. Uh, in terms of the doers, they can be full time, they can be part time, they can be contractors, they can be agencies. You can choose to upskill existing staff with new skills that you need. You can hire new staff with those skills. You can hire contractors to do specific tasks like to build videos or manage your social media. And then you can hire marketing agencies for SEO, advertising, et cetera. So there's a lot of optionality when it comes to the doers and there are pros and cons to each approach. Um, and kind of in a, in a very um, oversimplified sense, when you're thinking about how to get stuff done, uh, you have good, you have fast, and you have cheap, and you usually only can pick two, right? So you can get something done uh, good and fast, but it's not gonna be cheap. Or you can get something done that's fast and cheap, but it's not good. So what we generally find is that if you hire a good agency partner, they tend to be good and fast. They, they are ready to go. This is what all they do every day, all the, all the time, uh, but they're not cheap. It's expensive to hire a good agency in-house tends to be good, I would even argue better than an agency if the in-house people are good, and they're cheaper because you're getting a lot more value per, per hour. Um, there's no agency fee that you have to kind of pay on top of. So in-house tends to be good and cheap, but it's not as fast. You know, you have to onboard them, you gotta train them about your company. Oftentimes you have to take the time to actually find them. They're not like sitting there ready to go. And then contractors, these sort of skill-based folks that you have to plug gaps, they tend to be somewhere in between. Um, somewhere in between that fast and cheap. 
And there's a fabulous book. If you're looking to go in-house and hire people, there's a fabulous book called Who? The A Method of Hiring by Jeff Smart and Randy Street. That is one of my business Bibles it, whenever you're thinking about talent and hiring. Uh, and they go through a you know, seven step process uh, for hiring folks, uh, for hiring those A players, um, starting with, hire, with creating a job scorecard. So rather than the job description, they create a job scorecard, which is really about outcomes. What are the outcomes you want from that person? Um, they also have this like crazy intense interviewing process. It's like takes like five, six hours to just really ensure that you have the right person. I have yet to meet a company that like fully implements the who, uh, the A method for hiring because these interviews are intense. But it, it, honestly, you read the book and you're like, yeah, this is the right way to do it. Anyway, hi highly recommend that book. It's been very helpful to me and my clients. So here's what I want to tell you. When you listen to Russell Brunson and the other marketing bros tell you, this is the way to market, use click funnels and you'll get results. Or, you know, you got to use Google ads or you got to go to TikTok. You know, there are all these people out there and they're raising all sorts of, um, you know, dissatisfaction in you because like you're missing out on LinkedIn, the great new way to, you know, raise B, do B2B or TikTok, the hottest social media platform. Bottom line, guys, is marketing is one size fits one. Your marketing staff must fit you and your budget. And there is no single path or silver, silver bullet to marketing success. What I recommend is that you find a partner who's willing to find the path that fits you through the marketing jungle. Your marketing department will reflect your budget, your values, your personal ambition to grow, your preferences, and your unique qualities, the things that you as the owner bring to the table that differentiate you from the competition. And if you have a marketing partner that isn't taking the time to ask you about your ambition, like what are your goals for the next two to three years, personally and professionally, because that will determine how quickly we grow this company. You know, if they don't take the time to understand what are your unique qualities and your differentiators as a company, it, not only is it not going to be a success, uh, they're not a good partner for you. This idea uh, is a controversial. A lot of agencies and software companies are built on exactly the opposite of what I'm saying. But I really believe having worked now 10 years working with literally thousands of small businesses that what you're really looking for in a marketing partner is someone who's customer intimate, someone that will help you find the best path for you and your business. Remember, it's got to fit you. If it doesn't fit you, look, you know, it's not going to work. So where to start is you got to define your personal end goal for the business. If you don't know where you're headed, there's no way anyone can help you. And there are a lot of different modalities out there of what that could look like. So one of them is called the small giant modality. These are companies that choose to be great uh, rather than big. There's the evergreen movement, right? These are evergreen companies. These are companies that wanna be around for a hundred years or more and they're building for that. There are lifestyle businesses. I just wanna make a decent salary and not have to work all the time. There are companies that are built to sell, which is a great book by John Warlow, which is really about building a company so that it can get acquired. There's the ESOP or your employee stock ownership plan where you can sell your company to your employees or pass it on to your kids. Or if you want to get venture funding and grow as fast as possible, that's all different paths, all legitimate to growing your company. And all of those decisions of where you want to end up will determine what kind of marketing department best fits you. I wanted to give you another little rule of thumb as you're thinking about your overall marketing efforts, which is budget. As a company, you should never spend less than about five to 7% of your top line revenue on marketing. So if you're a million dollar company, your minimum marketing budget should be 50 to 70K. If you're not spending 50 to 70K, you're putting yourself at real risk. You're, you're really under-marketed. 10% is starting to get to be more of a growth 
uh, kind of orientation. If you want to grow your company and you're spending less than 10% of your top line revenue on marketing, you're really going to struggle to grow as fast as you want. And venture backed companies, software companies that are looking to scale, they might spend as much as 30% of their top line revenue on marketing to grow as quickly as possible. Almost every venture backed company spends most of the money they raise on marketing. Now, how do you spend that budget? You spend it on people, you spend it on ad dollars, and you spend it on technology and tools. Um, you know, we are big believers in who then what. So we are big believers that the number one thing you need to worry about and think about in terms of your marketing spend is, is, is who. Who's gonna be your director of marketing, your head of marketing, who's gonna be your project manager for marketing. Those are, those are and who are gonna be your doers. Those are the critical staffing questions that you need to think about and, and use that budget for. So, there's kind of different maturity models um, that we deal with. Um, the startup company has no dedicated marketing staff. Uh, their next step has to really be to get their origin story and their founder story down. Um, that will help them raise money. The under 500K in revenue, uh, they usually at that point will have some part-time person you know, running their social media. Um, maybe they'll have a junior full-time marketing staffer. Uh, you know, the next step there is really you want to upskill yourself and your staff. Um, for companies that are over 500K, you really should have a full-time marketing manager um, and a part-time CMO. Uh, and for companies that are over $10 million, you really are ready for a full-time CMO. And you should be looking to transition as much of the work you have being done by agencies to in-house. So I want to take a little bit of a detour now and ask any questions you guys have on that. We'll address them in the, uh, um, in the q and A. I I want to take a little bit of a detour now. We've talked about staffing, right? I want to now talk about once you have the marketing team and the doers in place, how do you organize their efforts so they're the most effective? Uh, and this goes back to a story. When I was in college, I actually was a journalist and I covered for the Associated Press uh, Princeton basketball. And they had this old codger named Pete Carrill, who created this system that he called uh, the, the, this, um, this approach to offensive basketball called the system. Um, and it was the combination offense. This was a proven process that he used to help take uh, moderately athletic white guys uh, and help them have a chance at beating some of the best teams in the country. It's one of the most famous systems uh, in all of sports. And there's this incredible moment, they call it the play, uh, which was the backdoor layup that uh, allowed Princeton, a huge underdog, to defeat the defending NCAA champion uh, in the opening rounds of March Madness. Um, and the, um, I remember I was a student at Princeton when this happened. Um, and I remember us all pouring out into the street, Prospect Avenue, and just delirious with shock that Princeton had beaten UCLA, the defending national champions, in a basketball game. It was absolutely shocking. And the way they did it was by executing flawlessly a system and using a play, the backdoor layup, to win. And, and the bottom line is that systems win. Systems are the way that the uh, David beats the Goliath, and the systems are everywhere. If you're a soccer fan, it's the tiki-taka. There are all these stock trading strategies, algorithmic tra strategies. You know, traction, which we talked about, is a, is a system. Rockefeller Habits by Vern Harnish is a system. You know, one of our BizHack alumni, Zenat Simone, had the CLEAR framework, right? Which is a five-step process for uncluttering your house. Uh, you know, there are systems for everything, including how to grow a beard. The more you look, the more you'll find. And it's actually one of my hobbies to go and look for systems. In fact, uh, there's even a book called Systemology, which is a system for creating systems. Uh, it can get pretty crazy. Uh, you know, like I, 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 I'm a business nerd, but even I am like, geez, man, is Systemology, like that's like one step too many. So there are operating systems which help you organize your work. And here are a couple that we really like at BizHack. 
One is called EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System. It was uh, written about in the book Traction, which I've mentioned a couple of times. There's Scrum, which is a fabulous system uh, based on the agile methodology and framework, which we'll talk about in a second. There's OKRs, which were developed by Google. Um, Objectives and key results is what that stands for. There's 4DX, the four di disciplines of execution uh, developed by Stephen Covey. All of these systems are worthy of your investigation. It doesn't really matter which one you pick. Again, it's just about what fits you, uh, but it is important that you pick a system. Uh, it can be a system you create yourself, but you just have to have a systematic process for setting goals and making sure that everyone's aligned with those. Why it reduces waste, it increases productivity, and you just need to make sure that you're disciplined in practicing these in your marketing and in your running of your business. BizHack has built a couple systems of our own. We're really proud of these. One of them is the lead building system, which we talked about in Masterclass 2. We teach it in our Digital Marketers Edge program. It's got the foundation and the six pillars, seven elements, and we generate nearly $29 in revenue for every dollar in advertising with the people who follow it in our classes. Um, Cheryl Cattell uh, and I helped build the Thought Leadership Pyramid, which is a system that we uh, teach in our Thought Leadership Edge program. And this is about how to get noisy about your thought leadership focus. Uh, and the average results is that we're able to get uh, nearly double the amount of times that people appear in LinkedIn search results uh, because of the content that they create. So I wanted to uh, introduce you guys to a really important concept in technology and manufacturing and increasingly for all of business, which is the agile methodology. Um, back in the day, the way that we got things done is we created projects in the waterfall approach. And the waterfall approach is you analyze the requirements, you design a solution, you begin to implement the solution, you test it, and then once it's launched, you maintain it. And this is the way that cars were built and software was built and companies were built back in the day. And what's happened is there's a better way. That better, better way is called agile. And it was pioneered in manufacturing by companies like Toyota and the lean manufacturing methodology. And the idea here is you don't wait to make it perfect. You get the minimal viable product out as quickly as possible in what are called sprints, and then you iterate, right? So you say, what can I, what piece of software, or what manufacturing thing can I manufacture in the next two weeks? Let's go ahead and let's make that. Let's put it on the marketplace. It's going to break. No worries. We'll fix it. And let's keep iterating and doing that. And this, what, this idea, which started in manufacturing and Toyota, uh, has now been, uh, become the primary way that software is built in Silicon Valley. And what's happening is it turns out that Agile is fabulous for marketing because it's this test and learn approach is really good for marketing. So we have started at BizHack to start applying the agile methodologies and scrum approach to helping our clients with their marketing. And this is really all about the, the, for, the, the fourth industrial revolution and the evolution uh, of the way our, our business works at the speed uh, of, of light. Um, agile is faster to market. It allows you to keep up with a faster moving world. Um, it translates, um, uh, it creates less expenses, uh, it's less wasteful and it's faster, and it's a really good for marketing kind of test and learn approach. And a lot of this is based on this Japanese concept uh, of Kaizen. Uh, I, I mentioned a lot of these uh, concepts actually come out of Japan. Uh, and Kaizen is really about simplicity. How do we find uh, the simplest solution to our challenges. And instead of trying to kind of create something perfect, uh, you're trying to do small consumable increments. And by the way, if any of you guys happen to be a startup or someone who's like starting a new business, I strongly recommend that you use agile and the lean startup methodology to build your product rather than you know, going into your basement, spending two years, building something, showing it to the world and then the world saying, eh, not interested. 
there are a lot of benefits to the agile approach to marketing. It's faster times, uh, more productive teams, more effective prioritization. You can change gears more quickly, which is so important in, in marketing at a time when things are changing so quickly in the world. You get higher quality work, better visibility on your projects, which is great for a CEO who wants kind of a sense of control over what's going on, better alignment on business objectives, improved morale, and roadblocks and problems are identified sooner. So it's just, it's just the way to go. It's the way that modern business is built. It's the way modern marketing is built. So as a thank you guys for coming today, um, we are giving you, uh, as part of the follow-up email we're gonna send you, uh, a handout uh, four pages long on questions to ask when hiring a digital marketing agency. By the, the number one failure point that we see in most of our clients is they're hiring the wrong agencies. Either the agency is uh, not the right cultural fit uh, or they're not good at what they do uh, or they're managing the agency ineffectively or they don't share the same, they're not aligned on goals. Um, and it's such a problem that we wanted to give you this as a thank you for coming today so that if you do decide that you wanna invest in an agency, these are some of the questions that you should be asking to make sure that they're the right fit for you. So in this next step section, um, I wanted to invite you guys to evaluate what kind of business are you and, and how much of a fit, like what would be the right next step for you, whether it's working with us or, or, or thinking about uh, what would be good for your company. And Tiffany, I think we have a Zoom poll that kind of corresponds uh, with some of these questions. If so you can go ahead and launch that. Got it. So, you know, over the years, we've worked with a lot of businesses and we generally see that businesses um, generally kind of fall into two camps. You know, first of all, there's that like sub 150K business where it's just like you, you're on your own, you know, you're doing everything yourself. And, you, you know, you build that with help and, and, and chutzpah and, and, and others to about that 500K mark. And until you get to that 500K mark, you're gonna to have to remain that head of marketing in most cases. Uh, if you're lucky, you might've hired a junior employee who's actually able to fill that shoe, those big shoes. But generally speaking, you're gonna be the head of marketing at that under 500K. Once you get past that 500K, that's uh, if you're at like a 10% of your budget, that's a 50K budget for marketing, that becomes a point where you might start looking at transitioning out of the head of marketing role and giving that to someone else. So what, the next is you need to establish what your personal goals are. Remember that idea I said about has to fit you? So there are two kind of matrix aspects of this matrix. One is, are you at sub 500K or that more than 500K? And do you want high growth or moderate growth? If you want high growth and you're small, you need customers. If you're high growth and you're small, uh, if, you, if you want moderate growth and you're small, you really need uh, to build around values. Um, if you want high growth and you're medium sized, you need a growth strategy, no more random acts of marketing. If you're medium sized and you want moderate growth, you wanna build out some uh, in-house capacity with your in-house team. Um, And so if you're a company that's small, scrappy, and you really want to grow, you're ambitious, your typical pain points at this, at this stage are that you're unable to find new customers, you're unclear on the purpose and values of your company, and you lack some visibility into the marketplace. So how to, how to relieve those pains? You want, need uh, to acquire the digital marketing knowledge to attract new customers. You need to establish a purpose-led foundation for growth and you need to expand visibility through thought leadership. And what BizHack can do to help you achieve that is give you that solid platform for future growth and the tools and know how to achieve your vision. Now, if you're a more mature company, but you've hit a plateau and you wanna grow through that plateau, you're, you might not be clear on your long-term growth strategy. You might be conducting random acts of marketing. You might have agencies that have been kind of good to getting you to this point or staffers have been good to getting you to this point but no further, and there's no real clear path to scaling up. So how do you relieve those pains? 
You need a strategic road pack for, for uh, roadmap for long-term success. You need experience direction from an expert, CMO. You need integrated, focused, and measurable marketing plans. And you need an introduction of scalable systems for growth. Easier said than done. Um, BizHack helps companies in that phase with an accelerated path to growth, sourcing of high quality marketing managers and specialists from our ally network, and upskilling your marketing team so that they can help keep up with and meet your growth ambitions. And so BizHack has solutions for kind of each quadrant. Um, and uh, the, the one that um, is the one that we've developed most recently is for those high growth, medium-sized companies, we provide fractional chief growth officer services to help drive the growth. We upskill your team. We get you uh, the right staff of uh, project managers and doers in place. And we really uh, accelerate the heck uh, out of your efforts. It's the most complete solution we've ever been able to offer. And then depending on where you are in your scale, maybe it's our courses or our coaching, uh, or our network of um, agencies that we can help you to access. So that is it for today. Um, I wanted to say that uh, thank you guys so much um, uh, for, for filling out the, the Zoom poll. We're going to now go into an AMA and answer the 30 questions that we have waiting for me, uh, hopefully about this and every other topic. Um, I'm so appreciative to you guys for showing up in, in, in force, uh, and, and, and I hope that you've gotten a lot out of this little mini course. Um, you know, the parting thought comes from Buckminster Fuller. If you want to teach people a new way of thinking, don't bother trying to teach them. Instead, give them a tool, the use of which will lead to new ways of thinking. That's the system, the lead building system, the thought leadership pyramid, uh, EOS. That's the tool that we want to give you. Uh, that helps you with new thinking. So um, we're going to now have uh, our AMA. And then uh, I hope all of you have filled out uh, the Zoom poll um, where you can request if you want uh, a one-on-one -on -one with a BizHack advisor who will help evaluate what the best, best path uh, might be for each of you. So with that, uh, Tiffany, we're going to go into the Q&A. Uh, and uh, we have 31, so we've matched Biz, uh, masterclass two. Let's see if we can't beat uh, masterclass one, which had 40. Got it. A uh, question. Do you want me to go with the commonly asked questions first and then into the 31 or vice versa? Yeah. Why don't you start with a couple of the 31 and then let's transition to the commonly asked questions? Of course. All righty. So first one, how can I drive digital traffic to my site immediately from Leonette? Great question. So the, there are a couple answers to that, but the, probably the best answer is through paid advertising. Paid advertising is, it's not cheap, but it's good and it's fast. And so I would definitely recommend uh, that you re set an ad budget. Um, Facebook and Google are the behemoths of digital advertising. You know, Google includes YouTube and display ads and, and text ads. Uh, Facebook includes Instagram and WhatsApp. Um, but th that would be my recommendation, Leonette. Slightly different answer, which is a similar answer, is hiring an agency to run ads for you would also be another very fast way to immediately drive traffic to your site. Every other approach is going to take you more time. All right. From Miguel, what is the most efficient way to get my company's name out in this digital market? Yeah. So efficiency is a, a really interesting question. Um, you know, the, the, it's kind of good, fast, and cheap. Uh, if efficiency means what is good and cheap, uh, it's going to be content. Um, content, high quality, original, timely content will always be the most efficient way uh, of generating uh, leads and sales. It's just not going to be fast. All right. And then we've got from Julio, what's a reasonable budget that a small business should set aside as a percentage of sales? Yeah, and we answered that in the in the presentation, but minimum of five to seven percent. Really, if you're interested in growth at all, 10 percent to 20 percent 
is, is your budget. So if you're uh, a million dollar a year business, we're talking about a minimum marketing budget of 100K. All right, and that's actually connected to one of the commonly asked ones. So I'm gonna go off that one. Uh, I understand that 10% should be used for marketing, but how do I break it up between staff, physical goods, paid ads, et cetera? Yeah, that's, that's kind of a fits you question. Um, there are a lot of different approaches to how to use that budget. And it's really helpful to have an advisor who can help guide you through the answers. There's, there's pros and cons to, to, to that. Um, I will say this, the majority of your spend will be on people. If you're spending most of your money on tools, um, I'm, it's very unlikely you're going to be successful. All right. And then from Chandra, what is the best way for an administrator tasked with marketing duties to learn how to use LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook if that administrator has very little social media experience slash use? That's a great question. Um, one thing, by the way, Tiffany, is feel free to integrate questions from the commonly asked questions just dynamically if you want. Uh, as as you feel fit or or if it's relevant. Um, and then we'll keep track of those questions too so that we can add it to our tally. Um, so the very clear answer to this, Chandra, is to is through upskilling and education. Um, you, 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 if you have an administrator, who has marketing duties, you must invest in educating them. It's gonna be the best investment you make. And uh, BizHack offers training, the Digital Marketer's Edge, the Thought Leadership Edge. There's also a ton of free training out there that Google and Facebook have created. It's called Facebook Blueprint and Google Academy for Ads. You can go to lynda.com, which is free, free through the library. There are tons of tutorials there. You know, if you're willing to go to the kind of jungle of YouTube. There's a ton of training on YouTube. Uh, a lot of it is more marketing uh, and, and kind of educational marketing than actual training. But there are a lot of options. The tough part is to know what to train them on. And that's a case where I definitely recommend you seek the advice of an expert in terms of what is the best tactics for you to approach to grow your business. All righty, should marketing be part of everybody's job or one to two people's job? Yeah, so communications should be part of every person's job. In fact, the most important form of marketing is customer service. So if you wanna call marketing like the human to human interaction with your clients and prospects, that's everybody's job. But you should have one person who's accountable for results in marketing, and that should be your head of marketing. And you should have clear lines of responsibility and accountability, and that person should get the job done or not keep their job. So you do wanna have individual accountability, but you do wanna make the, the, the communicating with your customers and with your prospects everybody's role. Part of that means that you need to be really good at communicating to everyone about what are the values and the mission of the company. and that is definitely the role of the CEO. Um, from Alina, uh, what are better tools to improve digital marketing? Um, yeah, there, there are three aspects to digital marketing, the, the people, the ad budgets, and the tools that you use. Um, and there are just a million tools out there. Uh, in fact, an overwhelming number of tools. Um, so the we actually put together a, um, a document that has more than 300 different tools that were recommended by other business owners. And uh, what I would recommend, I think, to kind of simplify this is one, you can hire an expert, uh, you know, have a CMO tell you which tools to use. That's the easiest way to do it because there are a lot of options out there. Uh, the other is if you don't have the budget, you're a little smaller and you don't have the ability to hire a consultant, then just ask your um, peer companies uh, what tools they use and, and uh, figure out the ones that best fit you. All right, from Kathleen, how to best use the hashtag to reference other groups when posting comments or other content in posts? Confused how that works. Are there any unwritten rules slash guidelines on this? Thanks. Yeah. 
Uh, there are a lot of written rules and guidelines on how to identify your, your best hashtags um, and then to use those. So what I would, the way I would think about a hashtag, Kathleen, is a hashtag is another way of grouping people around a topic. So everybody who uses a hashtag, they're basically saying uh, hashtag me too. They're identifying themselves as part of that movement of me too, or, you know, uh, hashtag uh, girl power, right? They're identifying themselves as part of that movement. And so what you can do is you can, you, you can research which hashtags uh, are out there, which are getting the most traffic, and then you can align your company and your marketing with those hashtags. So that's sort of the, the approach that I would take. Um, the equivalent to that in SEO and Google is keywords. So hashtags and keywords are really kind of the same thing in a different context. Hashtags are the way that you group people around content uh, on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook. Keywords are how you group people on things like Google and Amazon. Uh, and, um, and then there's some uh, like Twitter where you'll see both. All right, from Chandra, for how long will we have access to the recording of these classes? Yeah, so, so these classes uh, we have right now up on our YouTube channel um, and uh, they'll be there uh, for uh, quite a while and you can actually find 50 uh, other master classes that we've done on specific topics uh, over the last three years that you can, uh, you're welcome to do. I would definitely follow the BizHack Academy uh, YouTube channel. We'll put that uh, link in the chat uh, and, and uh, take advantage of all the great free material we have there. All right. Uh, how do I convince my boss that we need help in our marketing and need these types of serv services, whether it be upskilling, getting a CMO or outsourcing? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, um, ultimately, leadership starts at the top and if your head uh, of your company it doesn't want to grow or is kind of insistent on kind of using the the past methods for growth um it might be actually really difficult uh for for you to convince them and then you have a choice to make which is you know do you want to stay or not um i was dealing with a company recently it was a family-owned business and I was actually dealing with the CEO, but he, it was a family run business and he had to make decisions about their marketing and their growth with the rest of the family. And he came to them with a proposal and they vetoed it. They said, look, we think we're doing just fine the way we're doing it. And so now he has a decision. Does he kind of stick uh, as the CEO uh, of the company, uh, a company that he wants to grow, but clearly they don't in the same way, uh, or does he move on? And so if you're, in kind of a mid-level marketing role, you have a similar decision that you'll need to make. From Leonette, what are the best ways to locally optimize my website? What is local SEO? Yeah, so um, SEO is search engine optimization. Uh, search engine optimization means showing up in the organic search results in Google. Uh, organic search results mean the results you don't have to pay for when you like search on Google. There are like ads at the top and then the organic results, results after that. Uh, SEO is the most profitable form of marketing because it drives free traffic to your website and it tends to uh, continue to drive traffic um, uh, over the long haul. So the question really is how do I optimize SEO for my local market? Um, and you do that through directory listings. The most powerful way to do that is through Google My Business. So if you have a, a location uh, storefront, you absolutely need to be on Google My Business. Um, those are all different ways to do SEO. Here's one thing I'll say about SEO. It is very technical and very complex. It's very strongly on that uh, marketing technology side of things. And it is, I've never met a, a CEO who, who really has that background. Um, or expertise. So as soon as you can afford it, you should definitely outsource your SEO to a, a really skilled agency. All right, another question from Leonette. How can I increase my email list? You know, that question was answered in really great detail in uh, class two. So I'll just quickly say that it's through an irresistible offer. 
and go back to class two and you'll hear a little bit more about what I mean by that uh, and how to grow your email list through the lead building system. How much time and money will need to be invested each month to help my digital marketing efforts? Yeah, uh, th th that's just too specific a question. It's got to fit you and your growth ambitions. Um, again, you know, a 10% minimum budget, you know, you can, you know, if it's, uh, if you're a $120,000 company, that's 120 K that's $10,000 a month in marketing budget. Um, and then how much time marketing takes a lot of time. It's going to take time of the CEO to be the thought leader and influencer. And it's going to take time of the dedicated marketing staff to do the work. So, um, there are no shortcuts in marketing. I'm a big believer in this. I, you know, I know there's a lot of promises being made out there on, you know, if, if you're like me, you get advertised all the time by the marketing bros and the Russell Brunsons of the world about quick fixes. And, you know, it's oftentimes kind of hard to find uh, folks who've been able to actually implement successfully those strategies to grow. Uh, there seems to be more people who are selling those services, selling the solution than actually who've solved their problems with the solutions. Um, from Alvaro, how to generate warm leads for a high ticket B2B business. Yeah. Hey, Alvaro, it's great to be uh, so glad that you could join us today. Um, this is, uh, I'm a big believer that B2B, business to business, where you're selling to companies, B2C, where you're selling to consumers, B2G, where you're selling to government, it's all about human to human, H to H. And so the best way to generate warm leads for a high ticket B2B business is to get really specific about who your ideal customer is and to understand your persona pairs. In other words, who's the buyer and who's the user of this high ticket business. So uh, when you're dealing with a B2B context, you're essentially selling at minimum to someone who's like in the middle midpoint of the company who's actually gonna be using your uh, service. So like in Alvaro's case, he does fractional uh, technology services and, and staff augmentation for technology, you're going to probably be dealing with the CTO, right? But you, who's the buyer who's going to actually pay for that? You probably need to get the sign off of the CFO or even the CEO. So you have at the very minimum that persona pair where you're dealing with the CTO and a CEO or CFO, uh, and they have different interests, they have different needs, they need to be marketed to differently. And in a B2B case, that process can take anywhere from six months to 12 months to 18 months. And it, it includes a lot more touches than you would prefer. Uh, Microsoft did a study and the average B2B high ticket sale takes 18 touches. And most salespeople give up after four. All right. And, from um, and by the way, uh, you might have a little business prospect, uh, someone looking for fractional technology services uh, in the chat. So definitely share that with him. There you go. Love it. I love, that's building community, baby. Helping you guys get business. All right. From Summer, how can I track my marketing to what converted to profitable sales or repeat customer? Wonderful question. So there's the complex answer and the simpler hack. The complex answer is that you can use something called tracking pixels or tracking links that will allow you to track a customer interaction from initial contact on your website or social media all the way to sale. And there are amazing software, complex software like HubSpot uh, and Salesforce that do that for you. Um, the simpler answer is this. Um, I strongly recommend that you consider creating channel specific or campaign specific offers. So for instance, let's say you're running a Facebook ad, put an offer in that ad that is only in that Facebook ad. That way you know that if anyone redeems that offer, that it came from the ad. Uh, I'll give you an example. We, we worked with a Pilates studio where they were running a Facebook ad campaign where they put in a really specific um, offer that was only in the Facebook campaign. And then they had all these walk-ins of people who say, hey, I saw that great offer you're offering. Um, I'd like to take you up on it. They knew that those people learned about the offer through the ad because that was the only channel where they put it. So that's a simpler way to track where the leads come from. 
All right. Uh, what kind of KPIs will help me understand when I can afford to hire a fractional CMO? That's a great one. You know, ultimately marketing should be an investment with a, an ROI. Um, you know, an investment with an ROI uh, with, that might come over three or six months, but um, you definitely uh, want to think of marketing as not an expense, but an investment in growth. Um, and so the, the real question is how, how fast do you want to grow? Um, and that will determine how much of a budget do you need to get there. So, you know, I talk to companies all the time and they say, I want to double in size over the next three years. And I say, well, look, it took you 20 years to get this size. You want to do that in three. So, and you're only, you know, you're not even marketing right now. Like we need to really set a 15 to 20% of your budget for marketing in order to achieve that level of growth. All right, from Leonette, how can I advertise my business as better than the alternatives? Uh, it's a great question. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of marketing that says you wanna create your unique value proposition. Uh, or your unique selling proposition, your USP or UVP. And I think that this word unique is an almost impossible bar for any small business. L let's be honest, guys. It's very few of you are truly unique in the product or service that you provide. What you are is you are uniquely yourself. And this is why we really promote the idea of the story of me and the origin story and your purpose and your why. Because your business story, your deeply personal reasons for running your business are different than your competitions. And that notion of what fits you uh, and what that idea of what marketing is one size fits one, embedded in that is that if you can identify what makes you unique and differentiates you, um, that's gonna be the best path uh, to advertising your business. So really focus, Leonette, uh, on um, advertising uh, around what makes you unique uh, as a human being um, and what makes your core values and your core purpose uh, different from your competition. How do I choose the appropriate media to engage my content? What strategy should I use? Yeah, so we talk a lot about this in, in Masterclass 2, Session 2, but the, the lead building system is platform and media agnostic, and I think that's the right way to go. You really need to identify where are your customers and how do they want to be communicated with, and then identify the right channel. So the bottom line is, the right media to use is where your customers are. All right, from Rachel, how do you find a rock star part-time CMO when most people are looking for a full-time job? <laughs> oh, Rachel, uh, I don't think you intended this as a softball question, but I will say you hire a firm like ours because that's what we do. You know, I spend about half my time recruiting rock star CMOs. Um, I have a network of more than 80 of them. Uh, about half of them are placed with clients and the other 40 uh, are waiting for someone like you. So um, there are individual CMOs who are fractional CMOs who run solo practices and they usually can take on up to about six clients. Uh, and so if they have a spot for you, great. And you become their client and that's a great solution as well. The problem is what happens if uh, they decide they don't want to be a CMO anymore, or uh, what happens if you get started working with them and they're not a fit? Uh, that's where agency consulting firms like mine come in. We have, you know, 40 different CMOs, you know, almost like a staffing agency. You get to pick the one that really fits your needs. And if they're not fitting your needs, we swap them out immediately. Uh, and then if something happens and they're no longer able to be a CMO for you, we have, 40 others who are trained in the same methodology to step seamlessly into their place. So honestly, we really feel at BizHack that we have built uh, a pretty unique offering that combines consulting, staffing, and, um, and, and, and upskilling and training 
uh, in a really neat package. And we're so proud of the solution that we built. All right, good follow-up question is, how do you know your fractional CMO is good and how do you match them to a client? Yeah, so, you know, when, in BizHack, when we are looking to match a client with a CMO, we're looking for a couple of things. We want to make sure that the CMO um, has relate, rel relevant industry experience, um, has basically done the kind of marketing that you need done. Um, that just helps shortcut a lot of things. They'll have uh, agency relationships that they can leverage. So, so that's the first. The second, uh, which is probably even more important, is, is values alignment. We want to make sure that the values of the CMO are aligned with the values of your company. Every CMO that we bring on, every chief growth officer that we bring into our network is focused on uh, growing with purpose. They're purpose driven. And all of the companies that we choose to do business with are the same. And so the values alignment is there pretty much from the start. All right, from Lay, how can I find a good SEO for my company if I don't have enough money to hire a CMO? Yeah, um, that's a tough one. <laughs> uh, you know, we don't give SEO recommendations to folks who aren't our clients because what we found is that it really helps, it really is important to have a professional head of marketing to manage that relationship in order to get the most out of it. Um, BizHack individually went through three SEO firms in under a year. Uh, so even with our expertise, we know how challenging it can find, be to find an SEO firm. Uh, but we are not in the business of giving referrals. Um, we only do that for our clients because we have recognized that even if you refer them to a great and, and reputable agency, if they don't have the right strategy in place, then it's not going to be a successful relationship. And the only way we can guarantee that is if they're our client and we're helping develop that strategy. From Payal, how much should we budget for a marketing head? Great question. Uh, you know, if you're talking about a CMO for a sizable company, that's a 200 to 250K a year full-time role if they're US-based. Uh, if you're talking about the head of marketing for a smaller business, uh, it might be 160. Um, and for that reason, it's pretty much out of reach for most small businesses. And that's why you got to go the part-time route. For a marketing director in this market, you know, we're seeing, you know, salaries of 120 and above. Um, and by the way, like, even if you're willing to pay that amount, for many small businesses, good luck getting them uh, to want to work with you. But, you know, marketers like sexy products. Marketers like, uh, most marketers like, you know, marketing, uh, you know, they're not super into like marketing, like industrial machines or you know, um, or, 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 or technical tools or, or IT infrastructure, you know, the, the many of the businesses uh, that we serve have non-sexy uh, products. I spent one year as the head of marketing for an electricity company. I was bored out of my mind. You know, it's not fun for creative types uh, to market for certain types of businesses. When it's a part-time role, uh, marketers are much more willing to take on companies where the product doesn't turn them on. If it's full-time, you'll, you'll find it a little harder. So depending on what kind of business you run, you might find that it's literally impossible to hire a full-time CMO. Another question from Payal, best tips for converting marketing to actual sales. Yeah, I have a really good sales team. <laughs> you know, it, it, marketing is human to human and sales is definitely human to human. Uh, you know, I, I guess that the foundation is you know, the pur purpose driven approach. If you talk about why you do what you do rather than just what you do, uh, you'll be able to charge more, uh, you'll be able to attract your ideal customer and you'll be able to close more business. Next question from Illy. How do you know when your marketing is not working? In other words, what are the flags that we can identify to signal that the marketing is not yielding results? However, you're defining results. Yeah, so the first thing is define results, right? The result is actually a technical term in marketing for what is the campaign objective. And if you're not meeting your campaign objective, your marketing isn't working. Now, each campaign will have a different objective. The, the campaign objective of a video might be to get people to watch the video. 
So if you create the video and people aren't wa watching it, that marketing isn't working, that campaign isn't working. At a, at a high level, uh, marketing uh, works when you make money, right? So you should have a positive ROI on your marketing. We talked about customer lifetime value versus customer acquisition cost, and that you want the customer acquisition cost to be about a third of the customer lifetime value. Um, what's the name of the book for those who want to build to sell your business? It's called Built to Sell by John Warlow. It was the book I read five times in a row when I started my business. Love it. How do you calculate the amounts to be spent on staff marketing and tools for a new company? You should roughly do 10% of your overall budget. Cyrilla, nice to see you. What are the critical questions to ask a marketing agency contractor to see if they're a fit with your company? We have an amazing thank you gift handout for you that answers that in super detail. You're going to love it. Uh, Chenkevia, do you know any affordable systems for a business that just hit six figures last year? I'm a hairstylist and I do everything myself. I need help. I'm starting to feel drained. Oh, I feel you so hard, Chenkevia. It's like, it's tough. Um, Oh, my heart goes out to you. Uh, let's set up a one-on-one. -on -one I'll talk to you about it. Um, there's, there, there's not a lot of good options for you, unfortunately. You're at this stage in the business where you're going to have to run your marketing, and I know you're getting tired. And it's like this is why 96% of businesses fail. It's just really exhausting to to do this for a sustained amount of time. You know, the the the, the threshold. Uh, 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 of really having a place where you can start hiring in full is a million bucks. So you're ten. Uh, you're 10x away from that. So what we can talk about that. Cheryl Cattell, uh, why did you use the old image for the thought leadership pyramid? <laughs> Good question. Uh, Cheryl is my amazing thought partner in helping build that thought leadership pyramid and we will update the image. Uh, Sheila, will you provide the deck? No, we will not provide the deck. We'll provide a handout and you'll get an access to a recording of this lesson. Um, uh, Marcia, Maria Ricarda, do you have an advice for Facebook ads? Whew, Facebook ads is a really complex topic. We have a seven week accelerated course on Facebook ads that I highly recommend. It's sort of our signature course. It's called the Digital Marketer's Edge. It starts again in August. Um, and you can find out information about it on our website. And um, uh, uh, Roberto, if you could put a little bit of information in the chat about the Digital Marketer's Edge, the syllabus, so that Maria can learn more about it. Uh, my advice for Facebook ads is if you're going to run the ads yourself, that you get yourself educated before you try to waste money on it. Um, Payal said, people visit my site but don't buy. How can I change that? Um, that's all about uh, what's known as um, conversion rate optimization. So that's the area of business that you should Google and learn more about, conversion rate optimization. Uh, Lisa uh, Senior said, our challenge is developing the content. Uh, it is so difficult uh, to do that. One of the things that BizHack specializes in is building content engines for our clients. Uh, this is something that we do, um, you know, leveraging my you know, background and experience building content engines for NPR and other companies. It's not an easy one. It's taken us years to figure that one out. Tanya Goitia asked, is Spanish also available? Hablo español perfectamente. Estoy en España. Mi padre es de España. Soy doble ciudadano. Uh, uh, y tenemos uh, entrenadores y marketing coaches que pueden uh, darte uh, lecciones y consejos en español si quieres. Jose Quiroz said, can we set an appointment to know about your services? Uh, absolutely. Ricardo, uh, Roberto from my team, uh, please follow up with Jose Quiroz and we'll get a, 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 an a appointment set up. Um, Brianna Washington. Hi, Brianna. Uh, when it comes to digital marketing, do you feel it's the videos are the most effective way to drive sales. I will definitely say that having thumb stopping videos are the most powerful form of communication on digital. Uh, the vernacular of the web is video. You can see uh, Tiffany, my dedicated in-house marketing uh, video marketing specialist is totally nodding on that one. Laura Charlemagne says, I'm in the real estate rental and leasing business. Uh, what type of marketing is best? Um, th that's really tough to answer. Uh, so I'm not going to try. Uh, Alvaro said, can a doer have both analytical and creative skills? Yes, but they're expensive and hard to find. So yes, of course they can. Uh, there are always people who are both left brain and right brain. Uh, but I will tell you in my experience, it's 
cheaper and easier to just hire uh, one of each and have them learn how to work together than to try to find that whole package. Someone who can build automations in a CRM and do marketing and tracking analytics and write brilliant, awesome content and create amazing videos and do beautiful graphic design. That's kind of a unicorn. Uh, they exist in, you know, but not, uh, they're hard to find and good luck finding them. Um, Felix Bustabed, uh, Bustabad asked, I just upgraded my website to digital marketing with SEO and it's live now and I'm getting results through the quote links uh, and they are fixing my Google display ads campaigns. I don't see the question in that, so I'll skip it. Chandra, what are tips for marketing open jobs well on a small budget? Great question. It's actually the first of all of these questions that act, more than a hundred that asked about marketing for jobs. You guys forget that marketing for filling open positions is one of the most important types of marketing you can do. And the best platform for that is definitely LinkedIn. It's the number one jobs site. You know, you also have Indeed and all the new competitors that are coming up. My number one tip is go read that book, the, uh, uh, Who, build a job scorecard. And when you talk about the job, talk about the values of the company and your core purpose, right? And make sure that those folks align with that. If you want to hire a millennial or a Gen Z, they're going to insist on that. So don't ignore your core purpose and your core values in the hiring process. With that, we have wrapped up all of the open questions. We answered more than 40 because some of those were, uh, ah, how do I get my boss? All right, quickly, let's do 39. Uh, how do I get my boss to spend money on LinkedIn for our open accounting and consulting and marketing jobs? Tell them, uh, you know, how do I get my boss to spend money on marketing open jobs? Well, you can try the alternative and see where it gets you. Uh, but what I'm telling you right now is this job market is hot as pancakes. And if you don't spend money on marketing open jobs, uh, and marketing around core values and core purpose, you're very unlikely to fill those open roles. So with that, we're gonna wrap up the AMA, no more questions. Um, I'm so excited and honored to have been able to do Masterclass season five. Season six is insane. We're gonna talk about web three, metaverse. We're gonna give you guys clear guidelines and next steps and actionable items that you can use for your uh, Web3 and metaverse marketing, such as it is. Um, stay tuned for that. In the meantime, you know, uh, I hope you filled out the Zoom poll. Um, I'd love to have one of my team members have a one on one with you. Let's see if we can help you solve who's in your marketing seat. And if you're the owner, get you the heck out of there because it's driving you crazy and, and making you unhappy. So, with that, Thank you guys very much. And we'll see you for the masterclass in September. And for those of you who asked for a one-on-one -on -one, much sooner than that. Take care.